Does the world exist or doesn't it? What is the world? Okay, so we can all agree that the world is the universe. Are there other universes? We don't know. Multiverse theory is a popular theory now because uh, there's kind of this idea that it'll help explain why this universe exists. Because if, if this is all there is, then they have a lot of problems in cosmology. Like where did it come from? How did it get here? So if we agree the world is, you know, the universe, that's – so what is it? Well, it's all the things. We have its comprehension and its extension, Right, so it's comprehension, the universe. You have to understand what that term means. It's extension. It extends to all those things that are palpable and exist in this known world, right? And then you have uh, whether it is or it isn't. Now, there are some people that are argue that this is an illusion. It's Maya. You just think it exists. It's all in your head, and your head doesn't even exist. Right? There's people that will argue that. Descartes, you know, he started radical skepticism, and then he just came to the conclusion, well, the only thing I know that, that is that I'm thinking, and I must be here to be thinking. So my thinking gives me the, the reality of my existence. The Muslims would call that madness because they would argue that, you know, this is real. It has a realness to it. It's a type of reality. But it's one level. It's a martaba of wujud. It's one type of wujud. And then why? That's, that's the big question. And that's the question science. Science deals mostly with mahiya, right? It deals with the first question and the second question. It doesn't deal with the third question because it, it doesn't really answer why. It can answer how. It can make arguments about how. But to ask why, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? That's a big question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Where did it come from? Why is it here? Why are we here? What should we be doing while we're here? These, these are difficult questions. But for those who accept prophets... The, uh, the, the prophets have access to a level of understanding that normal human beings don't have because they're open. Revelation enables them to know things that can't really be known by intellectual pursuits or rational pursuits. So, for instance, there seems to be evidence for the jinn. I mean, I, I, I think... It, it's arguable that's a rational belief because there, there are a lot of very weird things that happen, and many people have had experiences uh, of jinn, many, many people, all over the world. But because scientists can't actually find them and analyze them, they don't believe in them. But many, many people around the world believe in jinn because they've experienced them. And, and there seems to be an immense amount of evidence. I would argue that there's more evidence for demons. You know, in fact, I find it really hard to believe why people don't believe in devils because there are clearly demonic people doing demonic things. And the Prophet said shayateen would ins- that they're worse than the shayateen of jinn. And so there are human demons. They just have no moral compunction. They have no regret or remorse for what they do. They're called sociopaths by, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists. But sociopath is just a word for a human demon. Shaitan. So, you know, those are, those are all reasonable questions. And the prophets, you know, unfortunately, I mean, Islam is a very reasonable religion, but it's been presented in a very unreasonable way. Um, and, I mean, I had an Arab friend of mine who used to say, it's, it's the best case with the worst lawyers. <laughs> so, um, you know.
you know, and then we have a we have a, a Torah. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm not a modernist, and I'm I'm very much committed to uh, tradition Torah. But it's not like the tradition doesn't have a lot of stuff that needs to be swept aside. So it's just who's going to do it and what are the skill sets needed in order to do it. But there's a lot of things in our books that need to be critically looked at. But you need the tools to do that, and it's not easy. So, And then the people that tend to do that tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? They just dump the whole thing. So, and then the ulama, some of the, they get, they got some things right and they got other things wrong. They're not all they're not masum unless they're a prophet. They made mistakes, but most of them had a hevot from Allah, the mahfuzun. But some of the ulama, even some of the greatest ulama, you know, you'll read things in the books and it's just, you know, in that area they might not have. They might have been people of their time rather than people of every time. Because you have, you know, I mean, I think one of the big challenges of Muslims in, in, in our time is, is to, to be able to identify what, what, what I would term, it's not a term that nominalists or, you know, modern people like very much in academia and things, but what I would call, you know, trans-historical Islam, the Islam that transcends time and place. The Islam that's, you know, when we talk about it, Islam al salihun nikuli zaman wa makan. You know, it's something that is sound for every time and place. Well, that Islam is the universal Islam. There's also particular Islams. In other words, they're not essential to the teaching. They're, they're particularized versions of Islam that emerged in times and places. And some of those have to do with misogynistic tendencies of certain peoples in certain times and places. Some have to do with um, elaborate patriarchal models that exist in certain times and places. You know, these are realities that, um, that Muslims need to think critically about. But like I said, who's going to do the thinking and what are the tools needed in order to do the thinking? I mean, that's, that's the challenge of really trying to restore this tradition uh, of training uh, that that is necessary to 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 be reflective and to be critical because critical thinking is the highest level. Uh, you know, in reading, you have you have coming to terms with authors. You know, understanding what the terms they're using and how they're using them, and then understanding their propositions. And then understanding their arguments. Once you understand those three things, you can be critical. But if you don't understand those three things, you're just, you're just making a fool of yourself. And that, a lot of people read books and they don't know the terms. They don't know the propositions. They can't identify the arguments of the author. And then they can't identify why those arguments are fallacious if they are or why they're not if they aren't. So these are, these are critical skills needed for any literate civilization. If you want to be primitives, that is a way of being in the world. But it's, it's not a way that's easily acquired. It's something that is transmitted over generations, and most aboriginal peoples have lost those tools. Mauritania is one of the rare examples of a literate aboriginal people, rare in human history. It's one of the few places in human history where you had people living aboriginal lifestyles with a high level of literacy. Amazing. It's unique to the Islamic civilization as far as I can tell. I don't think any other civilization ha- had literate um, aboriginal peoples, as far as I know. And, you know, I have a lot of admiration for aboriginal peoples. I'm not, and I don't think this is the only way to be in the world. There's a lot of illiterate people that are very close to Allah and in some ways closer than a lot of literate people. So, but if, if we're going to take Revelation seriously, if we're going to take the book seriously, if we're going to take Iqra seriously, these are the tools that our ummah developed to make sure we didn't go astray in doing that. That's it's as simple as that. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru wa tubu ilayk.